Hey everybody, welcome to this week's video. Man, I'm glad you took a couple of minutes. Hope you stay around to the very end and make sure if you like the content that you're gonna hear here today, check out some of my other videos as well and maybe you just consider subscribing. Hey, this week we're talking about landscaping in order to attract wildlife. Right out of the gate, I'm gonna tell you that I don't profess to be an absolute expert on the subject. What I will tell you though is through actual practical experience and some designing for parts of attracting wildlife, eh, I got pretty good at it. And not only that, but traveling a little bit now, I kind of pick up on a lot of different landscapes, different locations that really kind of put a spotlight on what wildlife likes and what wildlife needs. Hey, I'm glad you're here. Spend a few minutes with me. Let's get started, shall we? So if you'd like the real down and dirty for all those impatient little trolls out there, hey, remember this, food, shelter, water. That's it, provide that and you will have a steady stream of wildlife to your garden. But what kind of wildlife do you want? And are there some that you do not want? We'll cover some of that here today as well. Hey, one of the things you have to remember is when we talk about uh, food, water, and shelter tenants that go along with attracting wildlife in your landscape, you have to kind of boil it down a little bit. You don't want to attract everything if you're in a small, somewhat urban type of garden because oftentimes you'll end up with things that you don't want out there. And I kind of boil it down to, do you want something that's fur bearing or do you want something that's feather bearing? So let's talk about the feathers first, shall we? You know, attracting birds to your landscape is pretty simple. Um, if you really want the shortcut, you hang a bird feeder or two out in the backyard especially during the winter time, especially for those birds that stay in your area year round. Now, if you wanna have birds that are gonna actually take up residency, maybe build nests and have babies and populate the area, then you have to provide a type of landscape that is gonna provide the shelter portion of this tenant. And most of the time, not always, but most of the time, evergreen type of shrubs and trees are the order of the day. Deciduous trees do work for those that tend to nest a little bit later in the season after things have leafed out and they have a little more protection. Their nest doesn't stand out like it's got a spotlight on it where predators and, and raptors and those things can get to them. So evergreen type of shrubs and trees. The other thing in your landscape is diversity. Diversity of Whatever your landscape can tolerate, whatever you can tolerate maintenance-wise, uh, availability-wise, and that is a diversification of plant material. And you kind of have to go native a little bit. Most of the time, bird species in particular areas tend to be attracted to native type of species. Yes, they do hang around ornamentals as well if that's all they have left, but grass seeds, fruit, berries, other kinds of things that come on naturally around the area is something that you kind of have to incorporate into your landscape in order to keep those native species in and around. When we're talking about feathers as well, you're also talking about the ever so present and lovely hummingbirds that we have in the North American continent, South American continent. I'm sure they're, year, they're all over the globe. And the way that I have found, and I've had personal experience with this, and that is, yes, you can always hang hummingbird feeders and you can give them the sugar and all that other stuff. Yeah, it's kind of like raising your kids on Snickers bars all the time. But you can give them much more quality type of nectar and pollens when it comes to planting certain perennials and shrubbery that have tubular type of flowers. I had great success using things like penstemon, salvia, um, violent trumpet vine, those type of plants that grew in my area, and they were attracted to them crazily. Also, shallow water sources. Remember the old picture that I have on the stack slate urn. That one right there, 
those hummingbirds coupled with the penstemons and the salvias that we had out in the, on the ranch, man, we had hummingbirds there all the time during bloom. We did not have them because they're somewhat migratory. We didn't have them there in the depths of the winter. But I can remember one particular occasion when we first moved in, Maestro hung a hummingbird feeder out on the back deck. And one time it ran dry and we didn't really notice it right off. I'll tell you what, there was, if I could have had a video on it, it was hilarious. The hummingbird going up to the feeder, finding it dry, and then flying right inches away from Maestro's face and just chewing and ripping her a new one. And then it flew off. She filled it back up. It was back within 30 minutes. It was hysterical. And that is a little bit of dependency because at that particular time, the salvias and penstemons and other things were not blooming just yet. But you can see what dependency becomes when you have a clean food source for wildlife. Now, when it comes to water, hummingbirds like the shallow pants, so do songbirds. And the pondless waterfall that we had and the stack slate urn that we had out at the sunset deck were guaranteed clean water sources for the birds in the area. They also watered some of the wildlife as well, the fur bearers, which I'll talk about here in just a second. But man, <laughs> I can remember getting up on some sunny mornings and looking out the back slider and seeing the pond, uh, the pondless waterfall running. And there would be 15 or 20 songbirds right at the top of the stream bed. And they were just splashing and watering. And then, then I found another little ticket to it. And that is if you provide a quick escape for them, some place that they can fly up into like a tree and get away from being down on the ground, the water level, and they can do their preening and other stuff up there. A big, big key element as far as providing for your, your feathered friends out there. Okay, let's move on a little bit. Now, what about our fur bearers? Gotta be a little careful with this one, I gotta tell you because sometimes you can attract fur bearers that you really don't want all the time. One that I found that was kind of a pain in the ass and that was ground squirrels. I constantly fought them, especially around the berry vine line that I had back in the orchard and also coming in from the fields that were being developed around us. So they would come into empty fields to my next door neighbor's house. And then all of a sudden they found the ornamental side of Coach's garden. And all of a sudden I had those little coming all the way up nearly to the back patio and munching on this and munching on that. That may not be the kind of wildlife you want. And also understand that even if you provide all the native type of stuff that they like to chew on, if you don't fence off your vegetable garden and other things to prevent things like rabbits and squirrels and other stuff from getting in there, all your efforts and stuff may be for naught. You go planting 10 rows of carrots or six rows of various kinds of lettuce and stuff, and you don't have it fenced off, and rabbits and squirrels find out, yeah, all, all your, you, then you are. You're just feeding the wildlife. And if that's what you want, fine. Most people kind of would like to have a little harvest of their own to bring in at the end of all their hard labor. When you talk about fur bearers, the same tenants apply. Food, shelter, and water. And in the dry Central Valley, especially from about mid-May to sometimes well into November before the first rains would come back, water was at a premium. And so if, you f if they found that there was a, a consistent source, they would be back there every single day, every single day, sometimes twice a day. And there was many times, uh, I tell you the old coyote story, there was many times when that, that pair of coyotes, I'm assuming it was a mating pair, they were out there in the front yard and they were taking advantage of the stack slate urn. And then they would just camp out underneath the olive trees or whatever until I came out front and then they would hightail it out of there. Kind of neat, kind of neat to watch the, the interaction between the two. You know, they weren't dangerous. You know, they, they don't want anything to do with us. They just want what you have and what you can provide that just allows them to get from one day to the next to the next. Now, Back on feathered friends for just a second. Talk about shelter. Um, I can remember doing a landscape job up there in the valley. And I can remember a particular client that he was a uh, 
probably a 500 acre farm, a combination of almonds and grapes. And one of the things that he did many, many years ago, and that is he attracted the wildlife that he wanted there by building uh, berry brambles, berry brambles and wood piles and that kind of stuff. And what did it bring in on a regular basis? It brought back the cottontail rabbits that were in the area and also brought back the California quail, the state bird. And they would hang out in those berry brambles as their, uh, their shelter, their home, their protection. And then they would come out in the mornings and evenings and do their foraging and everything and then the heat of the day or if something threatened, especially overhead, they would scurry back to the brambles. So if you have the room and you have the desire, you might want to think about um, structural hidey holes that these guys can get back into. Now, berry brambles can get big. I mean, these brambles that were on this guy's property were probably 10 to 12 feet tall and 20 plus feet wide, if, if not 30 feet wide. They were generations old. And yes, they did produce blackberries by the pounds, but he never went in and pruned them. They weren't there for ornamentation. They were used for harvest, yes, but they also provided, that harvest also provided a food source for not only the rabbits a little bit, but the birds as well. So remember that when it comes to it. You will also find those fur bearers will be attracted to it, obviously. Squirrels, yes. You'll also find raccoons and possums and skunks and other things that will be attracted to that. But most of the time they kind of, they're kind of segregated. You know, the, the skunks kind of like to burrow and, and kind of get in and under stuff where the birds are generally up in the bramble and the rabbits are down at the very base with their little, their little uh, paths that they can use as escape, escape hatches, so to speak. Now, as far as getting birds and fur bearers to stay there and make it a home, you have to provide just the right kind of shelter. And all bird boxes are all great. I've found many, many bird boxes that are actually occupied. Um, I find if you provide the right trees, like the, the big southern pines that are behind me right now, those are the places where they love to nest. That's where at the tops at the top, most of the time, you'll find the raptors. They can over, overlord the whole area and they can see what's going on. The songbirds are more down in the middle of the trees and maybe in some of the high bushes. And you can hear them going on around me right now. Being the end of February, right, 2023, it is Twitter-pated season right now. Everything is going on. They're looking to start mating and nesting. And if you have that kind of space that kind of space and the ability to provide that kind of shelter, you are going to find you're going to attract a lot of attention when it comes from the wildlife angle. Now, remember that most of the time the cuties, uh, the songbirds, the rabbits, the uh, um, whatever you're trying to attract, those are also prey animals, right? So whatever you attract, you're going to attract the predators of that prey. And sometimes that's just part of nature, right? There's also a, another paradigm shift when it comes to attracting wildlife. Take for instance deer. Take for instance uh, pheasant. They also become a game animal as well. And there's food plots and other things where people spend thousands and thousands of dollars creating food plots for deer to come in. Uh, cutting corn fields and soybean fields down and then having pheasant hunts and that kind of stuff. Now, I love the ringneck pheasant that is part of the American heritage. I love seeing the male pheasant. I think they're one of the most gorgeous birds on the planet, but they're also a game bird. They're also pretty darn tasty. If you happen to live in the area of the country or world where you have pheasant, you know, you can attract them with, with millet and corn and other things that they like to have. Just be aware that yeah, you're going to have those predators and the two-legged ones as well. Hey, this episode is not very long. I'd really like you to consider um, if you do landscape for wildlife purposes, there is a litany, absolute litany of information out there on the internet. Uh, I did a little bit of research for this, despite the, the personal experience and some of the landscaping that I've done for folk. But take a look at what's out there. 
you could, you could read a whole weekend's voluminous amount of information right down to individual type of areas and plant material that you can get. I am so glad that you've stuck it out this far. You might want to consider subscribing. And if you haven't, check out some of my plants of the week. The podcast is out there every single week and the website. If you have a little struggle as far as how to do a landscape project, hey, maybe the website can help. The giveaway is always there as well as the inexpensive and very well-priced digital course that I sell. Guys, thanks for taking the time. I will catch up with you next Friday, every Friday. I appreciate your time. As always, to your landscape success, see you next week.